Well, good day. Uh, I'm Ron Soler from San Diego, and it's a pleasure to be back at NCBH. Uh, I do want to express my gratitude to Dr. Walker for uh, providing the opportunity for me to participate in the NCBH Digital Education Series. Uh, this presentation, I'm going to be giving you an update on balloons. Well, first, uh, I do want to have a disclose that I am a consultant and a uh, board member and stockholder of Therapeutics. So let's begin here. Balloon angioplasty began in 1974 when Andreas Grunzig began treating patients with peripheral vascular disease with a polyvinyl chloride balloon he developed. And after treating 15 patients, uh, he concluded that this is a pretty simple procedure and a relatively easy way to recanalize the pelvic arteries. So for more than 45 years now, balloon angioplasty has been used to open up stenotic and occluded segments in the vasculature. Stents were designed to improve the outcomes over balloon angioplasty, and PTA became commonly referred to as POBA, plain old balloon angioplasty. So why do we still need plain old balloon angioplasty? Well, first of all, Peripheral, uh, the peripheral vascular anatomy is quite hostile to stents. Lesions are often multiple and diffuse. Plaque and arterial resistance often prevent stents from being expanded to their uh, expected size. Instant restenosis is very difficult to manage. Calcified and fibrotic plaque burden may impact drug delivery of drug eluding stents. And with respect to pachytaxel eluding stents, there are questions of late mortality. However, perhaps the most practical answer is that compared to other technologies, balloon angioplasty is inexpensive and usually very easy to redo if necessary. Now, there are today many uh, plain old balloon angioplasty catheters uh, available. In the US alone, there are around 100 models from at least 15 different companies. These balloons may have different features, uh, such as over the wire or rapid exchange delivery, compatibility with different size guide wires, sheath size compatibility, balloon profile, compliance, and rate of uh, burst pressure, working length, et cetera. So there's a lot of variations. However, they all work the same way to open up uh, the stenosis or occlusion. And the mechanism involves first fracturing the plaque and then stretching the vessel wall. What is most important to note is that while the inner lumen of the stenotic segment is dilated to a diameter that approximates the, uh, that of the adjacent normal segment, the outer diameter of the artery is greatly increased. And this results in significant stretching of the arterial wall. This stretching of the vessel wall results in vascular injury. Studies of smooth muscle cells at the University of Pennsylvania show that injury was not a function of the magnitude of the applied stress, but rather the strain rate. That is how fast the cells were deformed by the applied stress. And, and this is due to the fact that the cell membrane is viscoelastic. Arteries are also viscoelastic. And we demonstrated this strain rate phenomena in normal pigs, uh, where we took a slow, gradual inflation to the balloon's nominal pressure, and this resulted in the lumen expansion with no vessel injury. But we took the same balloon, but very rapidly inflated it to its nominal pressure. There was extensive dissection and vasoconstriction. However, in peripheral arterial disease, plaque morphology and composition are quite heterogeneous. And this often leads to inadequate, unpredictable, and acute, uh, unpredictable acute angioplasty results. And this is especially true in complex lesion morphologies. So for example, we have a hard fibrous or calcified plaque. And this prevents the balloon from expanding the vessel. We apply pressure and put more pressure, more pressure, and then at very, very high pressure, the plaque finally cracks, but
but the balloon goes immediately to its full size because of the high pressure in the balloon. And as, as such, the vessel stretches very rapidly, like an explosion, and this very high strain rate often results in dissection and excessive uh, vascular injury. So sometimes you need a little bit of help to break through this hard resistant lesion in order to slowly stretch the vessel wall. Focal force or scoring balloons provide a concentration of stress that can crack the plaque at low pressure. And this is low pressure before the balloon is fully inflated. Then you can gradually increase the pressure to slowly stretch the vessel. A very simple illustration of stress concentration is shown in this next slide. Say we inflate a balloon at low pressure within a lesion. The pressure acting on the plaque is proportional to the force applied from the balloon divided by the area of contact of this force. If we place a small diameter wire alongside the balloon and apply the same force, that is inflate the balloon to this same low pressure, because the area of contact is so much smaller, the pressure acting on the spot is significantly higher perhaps high enough to crack the plaque at this low balloon inflation pressure. Today we have a number of focal force balloons and devices available so that uh, and these can improve outcomes in very complicated cases. All, these, all of these devices have reported impressive results, whether facilitating delivery of self-expanding stents, preparing a lesion for drug-coated balloon, or even use standalone to provide an efficient and effective economic solution to treating peripheral vascular disease. Since balloon inflation produces radial forces, maximum stresses would occur in the hoop direction of the vessel. And at least theoretically, the greatest amount of stress concentration would be provided by focal force balloons with longitudinally oriented elements and smallest contact areas. Now, however, I said this is theoretically theoretical because I'm not aware of any head-to-head -head studies that actually compare these devices. But there are a variety of longitudinal elements, and these include polymeric ribs formed on the advanced and forcer balloon, embedded external uh, metal serrated strips that are bonded to the serrator balloon, acetones or blades mounted on the cutting balloon, and wires external to the balloons of the vascular tract and ultrascore catheters. One advantage of the wire design is that the vascular tract and ultrascore are available in balloon lengths up to 30 centimeters. Now, drug-coated balloons are the next iteration of balloon catheters, and these have come a long way since the PACO catheter studied in the Thunder trial. Today, there are a number of pacotaxel coated balloon offerings, each touting a proprietary excipient coating technology, and there are some differences in pacotaxel dose density. Also, serolimus coated balloons are already available in Europe. Drug coated balloons will be covered quite thoroughly in a number of other presentations of the NCBH digital education series, so I will just note a few observations here. The benefits of pacotaxel coated balloons have been shown to be quite significant in reducing restenosis and the need for uh, reintervention, and this has been in both above and below the knee applications. Today, clinical outcomes appear comparable among the available devices and dose densities. However, in December 2018, a meta-analysis of randomized clinical studies of pacotaxel coated balloons and stents in the FEMPOP intervention showed a statistically significant increase in all-cause patient death at two and five years following the use of these devices compared to the PTA control. Now, this meta-analysis came under an immediate massive attack with the multitude of attacks centered on not looking at patient level data. After extensive review and meetings with all stakeholders, FDA convened a public panel advisory committee meeting uh, in, two, in June of 2019. Now, this meeting added data and analysis, including patient level data, as well as an array of perspectives from key opinion leaders in the field and esteemed members of the FDA panel. The highlights of the meeting were that there was indeed 
a late mortality signal, but there was no plausible causal relationship nor dose relationship. The short-term benefit from these devices continues to outweigh the long-term uncertain risk. And in addition, this is in addition to the improvement in the patient's quality of life. It was absolutely vital that clinicians discuss all available information with patients, including alternative treatments, so that there was a shared decision making about the patient's care. And there was emphasis uh, that was placed on uh, post-market surveillance as well as clinical studies to ensure that there's high quality data obtained, as well as adherence to follow up through five years. Now you can find a detailed summary of this meeting in the publication by Dan et al. At the American, in the American Heart Journal noted here, as well as FDA's August 7th letter to healthcare providers. Dual occlusion balloons uh, are in contrast to the drug coated balloons, and these dual occlusion balloons uh, are available to deliver drugs and provide a targeted delivery of drugs in liquid form. And this also, by using these techniques, you can avoid the washout that occurs with standard infusion catheters. There, there are um, the two balloons that are available are the occlusion perfusion catheter and the tapas catheter. These devices employ dual occlusion balloons to isolate the segment being treated, and they provide the opportunity to remove the drug post-treatment. This allows for sequential treatment of multiple vascular segments and vessels such that only one device is needed for the patient. And since the physician can administer any drug he or she feels is appropriate, these balloon catheters can be used in a variety of clinical applications. The occlusion perfusion catheter has fixed occlusion balloons to isolate the treatment segment, and there are a variety of models offering treatment zones up to 15 centimeters. A unique feature of this device is a space occupying balloon that serves to reduce the volume of the drug required to fill the treatment segment, as well as apply pressure to the segment. Tapas is also a dual occlusion balloon system, but here the distance between the balloons, that is the treatment zone, can be adjusted repeatedly uh, uh, anywhere from, to provide treatment zones anywhere from one and a half centimeters all the way up currently to 30 centimeters. The adjustability of the balloons uh, of the tapas catheter provide provision in delivering the drug exactly where it's desired uh, and the very compliant independent, independently inflated balloons allow a single device to treat a very wide range of vascular anatomy. And here you see the drug is being very nicely aspirated from the treatment zone. In the reported clinical experience to date, nine drugs in seven different clinical applications were delivered by the cap, uh, tapas catheter. And these were uh, in the areas to, treat, to manage thrombus using uh, 2B3A inhibitors and lytics, uh, sclerotherapy in the veins, treating prostate cancer. Uh, the tapas catheter has been used to treat peripartum hemorrhage management and manage peripartum, I should say, manage peripartum hemorrhage during complicated childbirth. Uh, and it's been used with office-based, uh, in office-based treatment of occluded hemodialysis access grafts. And this has been used with both lytics and pacotaxel. And the uh, catheter has been used uh, for re stenosis prevention using both pacotaxel and tacrolimus. Here we go. Now, likewise, the occlusion perfusion catheter has also been used to deliver pacotaxel, and this has been uh, reported some uh, very nice results. Outcomes in this um, below the knee cohort in their copper A study was actually in line with drug coated balloon outcomes that have been reported above the knee. So, my take home message is as follows. Balloons remain to be the most useful tool in treating peripheral vascular disease. For PTA or POVA, use slow, low pressure and long inflation techniques. 
where you have complex resistant lesions, focal force balloons can crack the plaque at lower inflation pressures and allow slow vessel stretching that can improve outcomes. Drug-coated balloons are very effective in reducing restenosis and the need for reintervention. The late mortality question is still under investigation, however. And targeted drug delivery balloon catheters can deliver a variety of drugs without systemic overload. And as such, there are many applications for these devices. Thank you very much for your attention.